Hello and welcome to this special rugby show here on France 24. Over the next 17 or so minutes, I'll be joined by rugby journalist Ian Borthwick in studio to discuss all the weekend's action as the pool stage starts to get to the business end. We'll also be crossing live to Jean-Emile Jamin, who's standing by for us in Lyon. Well, in the last few minutes, Wales have thrashed Australia by 40 points to six to sensationally leave them on the brink of World Cup elimination and secure the Welsh progress through to the quarterfinals. We can cross to Lyon now, where our reporter Jean-Emile Jamin watched the match live. Jean-Emile, a really impressive night for the Welsh. Take us through it. Give us a little play-by-play -play of the game. Well, we expected a much tighter game than what it actually turned out to be. In the last uh, five encounters or so, uh, the maximum points difference between these two teams has been about eight points. It was 39 to 34 the last time they met. Uh, that was actually in Wales, in Cardiff. The Australians came out on top in that game. It is such a different outfit to what played that night. Now they're led by Eddie Jones. Uh, and, uh, well, we wonder for how much longer because the way that the Welsh just picked them apart... Uh, it was an uh, utterly professional performance uh, uh, from Warren Gatland and his side. And it all started with that Gareth Davis uh, try. He just uh, broke through uh, the lines and uh, did terrifically to run through uh, unanswered and dot. We're having a few connection problems with Jean-Emile in Lyon. We'll try to get back to him as soon as we can. But I'm delighted to say that I'm joined on set now by rugby journalist Ian Borthwick to review a packed few days of rugby action. Ian, let's start with that wallaby disaster in Lyon. Yeah. Let's be frank, Australia are out, barring a, a minor miracle. How has it come to this for Australia, for such a rich heritage rugby side? How has it come to yeah, this? Yeah, you really feel for Australia. I mean, this, this is a humiliation for Australian rugby. I, I thought that the game would be tight. I mean, as as Jean-Emile said, the last four or five meetings have been very tight between the two nations. I thought Wales were a little bit in disarray. And I thought Australia, even though they had a, a rough season, that they would they would probably come up with the goods to be able to beat Wales. But but right from the start, they, they had that try scored against them from a first phase ball from 50 metres out. I've rarely seen an Australian defence get split apart by it like that. And it just went from bad to worse for Australia. And uh, I just, you have to look at the whole of the structure of Australian rugby. There's got to be an overhaul from top to bottom. And I think Eddie Jones also carries a lot of, a lot of the the blame or a lot of the uh, responsibility for what's happened here. Well, that leads me on to Eddie Jones. Um there's a lot of people talk about Eddie Jones. He, he takes up a lot of media headlines. There's not going to be a lot of people feeling sorry for Eddie Jones tonight. Lots of people feel he brought that upon himself and, and you know, he's brought this, this Australian side only appointed less than a year ago and he's, he's brought them nowhere. Yeah, well, it's always a big call to change a, a coach, uh, you know, not, not so long, no, you know, quite, quite a, a short time before a World Cup, but he took on the job. But then uh, I noticed that as the, as the World Cup got closer, he got more and more cocky, more and more arrogant, and more and more scornful towards the press. And I always thought, I think somebody who is scornful to the press has got to be very good. He's got to come up with the goods one day or another, because if he doesn't, then the press are going to turn on him. And, and it's very, I, I understand why people boo him when he's been shown on, even in France, when his, his face comes up in the stadium, people are booing him. Because he's become such an unpopular uh, personality. He said it's to deflect um, attention from his team, but at the same time, uh, he's just been around for so long. I think Eddie Jones thought he was above everybody, above the press and above the, the people who run Australian rugby and world rugby. Uh, look, let's, let's talk about Wales, because Australia it is a humiliating defeat for them, but everyone did expect this game to be close. Wales haven't been in amazing form for the last 18 months or so. They were excellent tonight, weren't they? For all of Australia's faults, Wales were really, really good tonight, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They were excellent. Their defence was excellent because Australia looked looked good at times with the ball in hand, but the Welsh Welsh just cut them down. But at the same time, they were very organised, and they just I think it was a, a very they, they'd be flying under the radar. I think is the best way to, to 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 describe it, which is typical of Warren Gatland. You see the difference between Gatland and Eddie Jones. Eddie Jones was all bluster, uh, uh, and Warren Gatland. Was 
was all very, very sort of humble and just flying under the radar. But but that was a complete performance from from Wales. I think it's their biggest score ever in in a World Cup game, and by the same token, the biggest defeat ever for Australia in a World Cup game. It certainly was something not many of us saw coming in Borthwick. Thank you very much. We'll be back with you very shortly. Uh, yesterday saw the tournament's, perhaps the biggest tournament's biggest game so far as Ireland, the world number one, took on defending champions South Africa in Pool B. It was a gripping, low-scoring affair which saw the Irish win out 13 points to eight here in Paris. The match went down to the wire and could have gone either way. Speaking at full time, Ireland coach Andy Farrell spoke of the lessons his side will take away from the win. It's wonderful to win, um, but the, the, there's not much in it yeah, between two good sides. You know, there's there's not much in it, and I think the best thing about it for for us is that we we get to um, uh, feel the intensity of of, of of a big game within this World Cup and, and and know what that feels like further further down the line and. Um, how we are able to be a little bit more composed, be a little bit more accurate and, um, and play our game a little bit more is invaluable to, to be able to learn those lessons with a, with a win. Well, let's dive into that game a little bit more. Ian, two high-quality teams on display last night. What was the difference between the sides? What did you see as the, as the major difference between those two sides? Uh, the difference was, I think, uh, Ireland's ability to uh, at attack the, uh, the the ruck and to uh, destroy a South Africans so-called physical superiority in that, in that area. And I think it was also Ireland's composure because they started off very poorly. They lost four of their first lineouts. They lost. They were penalised twice in the scrum. Many other teams would have folded under that sort of pressure. But Ireland just kept kept at it, kept, uh, kept the ball alive and kept, a kept South Africa guessing. And I really think that, uh, yes, it was, a, it was a low scoring game, but this was one of the most intense and enthralling World Cup games in the history of the World Cup, I would say, and certainly worthy of a, of, a, of a World Cup final in terms of the intensity, the quality from both sides. Of course, it could have gone either way. Uh, South Africa were perhaps unlucky uh, not to, to get some points from, from, from their kicking, and even with the last ball of the game, South Africa could almost have scored a try uh, to, take, to take the lead. But uh, I think that... Ireland showed resilience and composure and really lay, laid out their criteria uh, as, a, as a potential world champion. I think before the World Cup, we were whispering, Ireland's number one, but are they, are they good enough? They're good enough to win the Six Nations and the, and the Grand Slam, good enough to win in New Zealand. Are they good enough to win a World Cup? Well, they showed that uh, on Saturday night in Paris that they are good enough to win a World Cup. Well, let's see if we can try and bring Jean-Emile back in live from Lyon. Uh, Jean-Emile, South Africa have been here before. Uh, they lost in 2019 to New Zealand in the pool stage. Of course, they went on to win that tournament. You were there in Paris last night. How will South Africa re react to this? They won't panic, will they? It's a very experienced side. Uh, absolutely, and a lot of those players are still there from that 2019 win, so they know how to go over the line, at least in terms of uh, losing that first game, well, that big game, at least in the pool stages, and then going on uh, to keep their composure in the tournament uh, and beyond. Uh, obviously, Jacques Ninaba, in the press conference, he mentioned that they will take a lot of lessons from this, and it's the perfect game to learn from. It's a game where you can afford probably to come second in the group, at least if you look at who the quarterfinal opponents are. Uh, asking a lot of South Africans, uh, they actually would prefer France, uh, funnily enough, against uh, rather than New Zealand, uh, because they say that New Zealand knows them from the rugby championship. But uh, nonetheless, you know, you're looking at the South African outfit. Funnily enough, it could actually be even stronger Otherwise. than 2019. But that Irish side that they came up against was undoubtedly worthy of that number one spot. Uh, you know, the, the front pack, the front pack, the backs, uh, you know, all working in unison and really uh, synchronized. Like uh, we haven't seen an Andy Farrell side even before. Uh, you know, uh, Ian, they're mentioning that this island team, they know how to do it now. You, we've tested them in certain conditions. Uh, and.
keep on surprising, or not even surprising, they keep on proving uh, why they deserve to be there. Uh, now, South Africa, they're going to look at their kicking game. They're going to possibly bring in Andre Pollard. You're going to see him uh, maybe against Tonga being tested yeah. out. And, uh, well, we'll see, you know, if, if they're going to just uh, uh, spread the play a little bit instead of a 7-1 bench split, uh, now make it a 6-2. Uh, a lot of variation to come, I dare say. Yeah, John Emil, great to see you unfrozen for a little bit. Uh, let's go from Pool B to Pool A now, where f host France are sitting pretty at the top. They thrashed Namibia 96 to nothing on Thursday. It was looking like the perfect nice for the hosts in Marseille until captain and talisman Antoine Dupont was forced off with a facial fracture. The scrum half has undergone surgery and will remain with the squad, but it's a major doubt for Le Bleu's quarterfinal, which will be potentially, as John Emile mentioned, against holders. South Africa. Their starting nine, Fafta Clark, has said that he wants Dupont to be fit so that Springboks can test themselves against the very best. Yeah, I've, I see he's all over French TV and um, yeah, I really hope he recovers. Um, he, he's, he's a big weapon for, for France. And, um, but yeah, we want to play against the, the best side. I don't know if it changes. It doesn't for us. France is still an amazing team and a, and a lot of great players. Um, a rugby team doesn't revolve around one guy. So um, there's still a lot, of, a lot of stars there and um, yeah, just a great team. So it doesn't matter who we play. Well, Ian, let's talk about that injury that's got French fans so worried. Very simple question. When Antoine Dupont, potentially the best player in the world, isn't on the pitch, what do France lose in leadership and in terms of skill? Well, you called him the talisman, and he is the talisman of, of this team and talisman of the World Cup. He's the figure uh, that, that French rugby needed, and he's a, he's a fantastic leader. He's, a, he's also a, a brilliant scrum half uh, who has perhaps no, no equivalent in the world for the, for the complete game he can play. Um, but uh, I don't share the sort of anguish shared... Uh, expressed by a lot of people since his injury. Of course, one feels for, deeply for him, and I've got a feeling that he's not going to make it back, and you, you really feel for, for Dupont and his family uh, and, and, and the team, but I, I think they, France have got two, if not three, very good scrum halves who can step up, Lucu and Couillot, who are both in the squad at the moment, and if they did come to deciding uh, for Antoine Dupont not to continue. Then there's Baptiste Serrain waiting in the wings, and he almost, I, I feel, would be a first choice with one of the others as a second choice in the, in the uh, closing stages of the champion semi-final and, and, and final if they get there, of course. Yeah, and still a huge loss. And as you say, it's tough to see one of the best players out through injury. We'll want to see the best players play. jean mean, if I can bring you back in, the hosts have, of course, now lost Dupont and Roma and Tamak through injury, potentially their two best players. Will the other sides in, their tour in the tournament be looking at France as less of a threat now? I think you have to look at the way that Fabien Galtier has basically organized his side uh, since he took over post the 2019 World Cup. And uh, he's really made Antoine Dupont the fulcrum and then Roman Tamak the pendulum swinging off of him. And now if, if you're looking at this team without them, I, I, I know obviously made. they've got a lot of, they've got a lot of depth. And... The, that uh, uh, Bordeaux pairing, uh, you know, uh, Kou and, and uh, Jalibier, they can really take France uh, through to the quarterfinals if they have uh, one of the games of their lives. I think that if you're coming up against an island or a South Africa, you know, they, these kind of players can be targeted uh, from uh, incredibly powerful forwards. And at least in the tackle also, uh, you know, the rucks uh, are going to be... Uh, Furious, and uh, if you're looking at the flankers of South Africa or Ireland, you know uh, Peter Stiftetoy, Josh van der Fleer, uh, they can target your your backs. And uh, I don't know uh, if it was up to me, if I was an opposition player looking at this, I would certainly look at France and say, you guys have become a whole lot more vulnerable. Uh, but of course, it is on home ground; it, it is on home turf, and uh, this is France's best chance, even across the park. They've still got Damien Pinot. They've still got uh, that uh, really extraordinary uh, front row. Uh, so France can do work across the field still. 
I've got to say, it's good to see Jean Emil feeling the love there in Lyon, certainly from some fans who are cozying up to him uh, quite tightly. Um, uh, that France match was one of eight fixtures played in this round. Here's the full list of results as well as the matches we've already discussed. Argentina edged past Samoa 1910. Portugal were inches away from earning their first ever World Cup victory, had to settle for a point against Georgia. England ran in 11 tries as they thrashed Chile 71 to nothing. And earlier today, Scotland got their campaign up and running with a convincing victory over Tonga. Well, one team that you didn't see on that graphic is New Zealand. They, of course, didn't play this week. They've won one, lost one after suffering a defeat in the opener against France. And I just want to ask you quickly, Ian, where are New Zealand? This almighty force seen as previously... Do, do teams think they've lost that edge? Will, will teams still see them as a serious threat to win this World Cup? New Zealand's always a serious threat. I think teams are probably taking them a bit lightly uh, after the, the two losses they've had against the big one against South Africa, of course, at Twickenham, and they're losing the opening game against, uh, against France. But they showed against Namibia that they've, uh, they've still got um, a lot of class, and if they can get their fast, fast ball... Uh, and if they can get their game going, then it's going to be, they're going to be very hard to stop. Uh, maybe we're still a long way off. They've still got a long way to go. But I think the, the All Blacks are quite happy to be, to be keeping quiet, just playing away and working on their game. And I would think working on the fine margins that make their game what it is and make their game so difficult to defend against. And I think that they, uh, perhaps other teams will take them lightly, but I think they'll, they'll be st certainly a, a real threat in this World Cup. Well... Ian Borthwick, thank you very much for joining me in studio. Thanks, of course, to Jean-Emile Jamin, live from Lyon. And just a reminder to viewers that we will have a special rugby show on France 24 every Sunday at 10 past 11 Paris time, where we'll be discussing everything to do with the Rugby World Cup. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned for more news in just a few minutes' time.